Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I am delighted to see so many of you here. To be honest, I'm surprised to see so many of you here because this is the first panel on the last day of what has objectively been a really intense conference. And I'd like to give a big shout out to the BlockWorks team for putting together such an amazing cast of ideas, events, stars. But on the other hand, spoken like a true economist, I am not surprised to see so many of you here, given the caliber of the panel we have today. We're very important people. Very important people. I'm joined by two people. Don't believe me, ask my wife how important I am. (laughs) I do have her on the phone, actually. Um, I am joined by two people who are worth getting up early to hear from. I'm joined by two people who no doubt need no introduction to this audience, but formalities. I'm joined by Anthony Scaramucci of Skybridge Capital, Dan Tapiro of 10T Holdings. Thank you so much for being here. I am Noel Acheson of the Crypto is Macro Now newsletter. Diving right in because we have an ocean of topics to cover. We're not even going to get to a fraction of them. We're here to talk about the macro case for crypto. Now, this is not going to be a discussion about the macro economy, as fun as that would be, because we start pulling on one thread and a lot of threads suddenly start unraveling. We're here to talk about the macro case for crypto with some macro elements, how macro trends, how macro data is impacting the crypto market. So where to start? In my experience, the best place to start is usually at the beginning and both of you have decades of experience managing money in different forms for some of the largest names on Wall Street. And yet, a few years ago, both of you pivoted part of your focus to the crypto ecosystem, direct investing, equity investing. And I'd like to hear why, what drew you to crypto, what was your thesis back then, has your thesis evolved over the years? Anthony, I'd like to start with you. Oh, thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so Dan is more of an OG than me, so I really like to hear from him. But I, I had a meeting with the Winklevosses in 2014. I'll just give you a sense for my head density. I'm very thick-headed. They explained to me what Bitcoin was and the blockchain, and I took it for granted. I didn't listen to them, and I said, "Yeah, I'm an institutional investor. I don't really get it, and you know, it seems ridiculous." And then um, I went to the White House, and uh, I spent 11 days in the White House. And this happened on a Wednesday, and the reason I know it was a Wednesday, I was only there for one Wednesday, so (laughs) I know it was a Wednesday. And I was in the Roosevelt Room, which is off the Oval Office, and there were two Fed representatives, and they were presenting a white paper on the potential digitization of the U.S. dollar. You can go back, this was July of... 2017, and I walked into the meeting, and they were explaining what they wanted to do. And of course, it didn't happen, but I said, wait a minute, this, the blockchain? I said, the blockchain, and these two young men were owners of Bitcoin, and they believed in the blockchain, and I remember saying to myself, okay, I've got to understand this better. The Winkle bosses are probably right. I'm obviously dense. I went back to my office. I wrote down some notes. About four days later, I got fired. About five days after that, I bought the URL uh, skybridgebitcoin.com. And then I got very frightened because I was like, okay, it's probably not the right thing to do. I've got all these institutional investors. So I made a list. I said, three things have to happen for me to buy my first Bitcoin. And number one, Bitcoin has to get to or close to 100 million wallets because therefore there would be a network effect and it would have an exponential expansion. Second thing I had to get comfortable with was regulation. I had to believe that the United States wouldn't ban Bitcoin or do something nefarious to Bitcoin. And so uh, if you really study U.S. property law, once the IRS said that Bitcoin was intangible property, I knew we were fine. I knew that there would be no way that a regulator, a czarist regulator, you know, like a Gary Gensler could block something like this. Just the court system in the U.S., the common law system would protect you. And then the third thing is I had to get comfortable where to custody if I was going to buy nine figures worth of Bitcoin. And so when all of that materialized in November of 2020, we started buying Bitcoin. I don't know, it was probably 17, 18, 19,000. Dan, what's your origin um, story? So, yeah, I was in the money management business for 25 years, the traditional world. 
and uh, lots of opportunity in the 90s and 2000s. And I, I frankly got, I think, a bit stale. Um, you know, so I had decided just to stop. And, you know, there was nothing that I was specifically focused on, but I love looking for these asymmetric macro structural changes. And uh, this is the biggest one maybe of all time, certainly the biggest one I've seen in 30 years. And so I was driven to it. It was a little more in the beginning, more of an intellectual exercise. Uh, I was introduced to Bitcoin originally in 2014 through a physical gold business that I own mm -hmm. uh, called GBI. And we integrated with BitReserve, which is the Uphold wallet. And it um, took us a year to integrate, but we were the first place you could buy or sell gold to buy or sell Bitcoin. So I came at it from that perspective, gold, store of value. I'd been trading gold since the 90s as well. So I had a really good understanding about why you own gold. Right? It's an anti-fiat and all these phrases that um, you don't really hear that much in the old world. Everybody here, you know, has problems with fiat. I mean, I can, in the 1990s, I don't think you ever heard anyone really talk about fiat. So it's a more educated crowd. But um, that after that introduction in 2014, I tried to figure out, like, to really deeply understand Bitcoin. But the problem is, uh, the white paper is very complicated, and I wasn't a cryptographer or technologist, a programmer, and I, I gave up actually many times over the next few years. And I would sort of get, I would get to the phrase, you know, proof of work algorithm, and I'm thinking, oh my God, forget it, just you know, forget <laughs> the whole thing. Merkle trees. And, yeah, I forget <laughs> it. And uh, but then in 18, 17, and eighteen, it was a traditional. A bubble up and then a collapse of, of about 90% in the price. And I said, well, I've seen that in the traditional markets a lot. Either it's going to zero now or it's really the buying opportunity. So I didn't give up this time. And I went deep uh, into research and then realized how stupid I was not doing that in 2014. But to be honest, I think the literature the the academic uh, literature wasn't really there in 14. I mean, you had Antonopoulos out there, but by 1819, you know, you had the Safadi and Amus book, you had, uh, you know, Jan Pritzker's book, and just a, a lot more um, uh, varied, but also a lot more in-depth analysis from the pundits and podcasts, and, you know, it's a very lively community. So it was easier to understand, um, in, a, in a sense, if you did the work, uh, you didn't have to do everything on your own. Proof so of work. what's that? Proof it, of work. It's exactly right. <laughs> and that applies to everything. I mean, I, I, it's remarkable how much that applies to everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, did the work and I thought, oh, my goodness, this is like, a, you know, a, a truth mechanism. It's a, a ledger, a permanent ledger it can be applied to everything. And you know, as a macro guy, you're looking for normally changes in liquidity or central bank policy. But in this world, you know, Metcalf's law is more important than, you know, earnings. And that was also something a little bit difficult for me to switch my mind to. So the network, your 100 million wallets, uh, the growth and development of the network had value itself. And so I made a bunch of different changes all at once. And then I realized oh my goodness, this is the future. And then I look at how the assets in the old world have performed against assets in the new world. Um, you know, in the last 10 years, of course, you have the S&P 500. It's down 99% against Bitcoin. It's down 99% against Ethereum. Uh, the S&P is down 99% even against Ripple, um, against all of these various uh, not all of them, but many of the top cryptocurrencies. So it just shows you the value accrual is happening in the new world at the expense, or let's just say relative to the old world. And so for me, it didn't make any sense to have any assets uh, held in the old world anymore. So, it's so that a was a basic macro. Network yeah. plus the performance was the, 
what got your thesis. Yeah, I care about performance. Yeah. yeah, I was always in that. On place. a fairly uplifting public service announcement here, to hear these two gentlemen say that they have been stupid at various points in their careers has to be a really uplifting message for all of us here, no? I missed Uber too, not that you guys are asking, but when Travis came to my office, he, he I said, wait, you want to send my daughter around in an unknown car, a black car around New York City, the guy we don't know? He said, yes, that's the stupidest idea that I've ever heard. Because of so the, I missed that yeah, one too. The golden yeah, rule, I, you I, don't get into a car I've with a, a whole, stranger. Yeah. I've had a whole <laughs> series of misses in my life. But I just want to say something about Dan for a second because his research is so incredibly thorough. And when I have wavered because... I'll confess, I probably, don't, I, I probably don't understand it as well as Dan Tapiero. I went to an event with Dan, and I heard his presentation. I think we were in Zurich, I don't know, probably like this time last year. And so, you know, Bitcoin was in the mid-20s or high-20s, and Dan made a presentation. And I'll never forget this one slide that Dan showed. It was an adoption curve of Bitcoin, an adoption curve of digital assets. And he had it at 1998, this is a year ago, and I think you said in that presentation, I remember very vividly that there was a 4% adoption. And so if you were tracking it to web one, this would be 1998. So just think of what happened to web one from 1998 to 2024. And so I guess, uh, where are we now? Are we 5%? Maybe six percent. Yeah, maybe five, six percent. Yeah. I mean, the 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 point I think was that in the following ten years, from '98 to '08, the adoption of the internet uh, grew six times. And so, if you are, let's say, placing bets or investing in the space, you have nice macro wind at your back. You have at least uh, a six x. So you're not fighting the other way, right? I think the old world is really contracting on itself. You know, you look at the number of hedge funds, just as an example, I know they manage about $3 trillion, but in the early 90s, it was just a, you know, maybe a hundred billion or a few, maybe maximum. And so mm -hmm. you really want to put yourself in the way of a powerful macro, structural macro change. And in the early 90s, it was alternative asset management. That was a big bull trend. And um, here, this is the digitization of all value. And um, I, I don't know what's bigger than that. And at a global level as well, the internet rollout was very dependent on hardware and on telecoms licensing. This is a global network. A Bitcoin in Nairobi is exactly the same as a Bitcoin in Paris is the same as a Bitcoin in Miami. That is something that we haven't seen before. But um, Anthony, how has your, has your thesis about crypto evolved since you first sat in that room with the Fed paper? Well, I'm, I'm using more hair dye, by the way. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm sure I'm like... I noticed that. I'm it looks sure good. <laughs> well, I was, I was using Cuban leader black, but it looked like shit on television, so I lightened it up. It's now Latin American dictator brown. <laughs> but, but what I would say to you is that, like, this, this shit ages you, man. I mean, you know, I, I started, I put some positions on, my clients yelled at me, and Dan could appreciate this because these were traditional institutional clients, they said, why are you buying that garbage? And so I bought it. And then 2021 was an incredible year. And I went from being a dummy to a genius. And then shortly after being a genius, I was a dummy again. And then, the, you know, our firm got wrecked. I mean, let's just talk very honestly to everybody here. We were down 39% in 22 there was a Bloomberg journalist on the hunt for me. I think she wrote a financial obituary about me, a financial obituary about my firm. And she, I think the title of it was Skybridge sucked, but then he met FTX and it got even worse. I mean, I think that was the <laughs> title of it. And so uh, the New York Post had me in a boat sinking. You know how they do these caricatures in the tabloids? <laughs> and so I looked like Tyrion Lannister from the Game of Thrones and I was like, sinking and the SS Mooch and the, I was an imbecile again. And I stayed in everything. And there's young people in here, so I'll give you a couple of lessons from 36 years on Wall Street. I stayed in everything. I let Sam Bankman freed by 30% of my business. I owned that, I explained that, I apologized for it. I was accountable for it. 
I spent four and a half hours with the Department of Justice, which also included the IRS and the FBI. You want to talk about a shitty day. I mean, that was a really bad day. Um, and I'm sitting here now with a pile of Bitcoin and a pile of Solana and Ethereum. And the firm is, I don't know, I'm probably not allowed to talk about my performance, but just talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoin's had like 160% move, Dan, since the bottom. And a third of our assets are in Bitcoin. So you, you do the math. And so in quick summary, if you have conviction, stay in something. If you get something wrong, own it. Don't pretend it didn't happen to you or do what a lot of people do is they blame it on other people. When I, when I got fired from the White House and the journalist said, what happened? I made mistakes in the White House that caused my firing. So I deserve to be fired. Didn't blame anybody other than myself. Same thing with Sam Bankman Free. But if you believe in something, stick to your guns and hold your positions uh, and don't focus on what other people think. I think that's the message that I would give people from the last three years. That's a very And if you need message. a good colorist in New York, I have several, by the way, <laughs> depending on where you live. That's a beautifully uplifting message tying into what Dan was saying about this is a structural macro change and you don't see that every generation even. Now, looking forward, uh, again, macro case for crypto, uh, Dan, what do you see as the biggest macro driver for crypto prices over the next oh, couple of months? Oh, I mean, uh, it's easy and sort of boring a little bit. I mean, the ETF, um, you know, everyone's heard a lot about it, but it's, you know, you've onboarded literally tens of trillions of dollars of value uh, sitting in global equity accounts that can now just push a button and own Bitcoin. So it's as if Coinbase, in effect, over, overnight, you know, added 100 million MAUs or whatever it is. And um, I think it's a very powerful trend. It's the first inning of it. Um, I have, you know, many investors, very sophisticated, uh, tens of millions of dollars in my fund. And they've said to me, you know, guys in their 50s, 60s, uh, I'm not going to open up an account on Coinbase or Kraken. And by the way, I'm just going to wait for the ETF. This is for years they've been saying this. I want to see it in my stock account. I want my broker to look at it. I mean, it's crazy. Um, but it's the, it's the American investor's nature. And so I think it continues for a, a long time. Um, and we haven't seen such a uh, anything that's been so concentrated from the demand side. You know, it's like a, there's like a little a bridge and the entire... U.S. wealth management world is trying to cross this little bridge into, into the new world. So, Drilling down on yeah. that a little bit, yes, the ETFs are huge in material for flows, but what is the motivation for wanting the ETF in the first place? What is the, oh, I think do they want to cross that? Yeah, bridge? I think it's just simple. Um, even if you don't understand it, it's the old Wences Casares idea, get off zero, which is to say that you don't understand it, you don't know what's going on here, but do you really want to have zero exposure? Why don't you just put 1% in, dip your toe? And so if everyone's dipping their toe at the same time. A lot of money. Right. And I think that's what's going on. There's a natural progression. People buy Bitcoin initially. They see it. Hopefully it moves up. They have it in their account. Maybe they forget about it. It's doing something. Then they look at Ethereum. And then that's usually the next one. And then people start investigating the space more deeply. Um, but um, I think that's the natural, that, that was my path, certainly. Makes the diversification a no-brainer, really, and you know, a small, small portion can add up when that's spread around a lot of accounts. Yeah, I mean, I, I had, uh, in 2019, so I chaired the investment committee of a school, um, just you know, charitably, and it's actually quite a large endowment, and I convinced the committee to put 1% of the endowment. And it, it took me a while. And there's some very well-known people on this committee and they're you know, running major banks. And you know, these are guys who've known me you know, for 30, actually more, 40 years. And they're like, Dan, we, we know you, we love this. Anyway, it took me two hours and I had some help as well from uh, another person to convince them to put 1% of the endowment and into Bitcoin and ETH, and we did in the first half of 19. The 5 million went to 58 million, 
everyone was trying to you know sell and they were like oh my goodness this has blown out the performance of the endowment the best performing uh, high school endowment in the u.s and then it went down to 13 and you know dan what did you do to us still up you know at 2x <laughs> it's now i don't know over 60 million and everyone knows i haven't gotten a single message on it yet because i said look we're gonna buy it and we're gonna hold it for 10 years and i don't want to hear about it for 10 years this, this session is a lot cheaper than my therapist man i love that. <laughs> this is great i mean i may lay down before the 20 minutes are up right yeah you know. but i mean this is what you go through right and and the thing is like i mean if you don't know who dan tapiero is from a traditional finance world he was one of the legendary macro investors he's worked for all of the legendary hedge funds he was a uh, star in that space so he didn't need to go into this space and go through this aggravation i mean he didn't but you saw something and the same thing that i would say when i saw what was happening i was like okay i'm gonna put my career on this i'm gonna bet my career on this i'm gonna take the vomit comet the volatility ride on this because i see this being the future you know, I was in this ballroom in 1985. I was eating prawns. They were terrible. I was a student at the London School of Economics. I was living in, in Paddington. And you, to make a phone call to my parents, I had to call them on Wednesdays because that was like Prince Spaghetti Day. And so I had to call my mother on a Wednesday, let her know I was safe and blah, blah. And I had, a, I had to get a, uh, a phone card and I had to punch in the numbers and it was $5 a minute to make the call. And today it's $0 a minute. You're transacting with your bank, and I don't know what they're charging you, or maybe you have a lot of money in your bank, so they're not charging you. But the average person is either unbanked or they're getting hit with a lot of fees. But over the Lightning Network or over the blockchain, like the phone system, it's going to zero. And if you don't see that, okay. But I want you to see it because that's where the future is going to be. The same way uh, in 1985, the future changed as a result of the innovations related to the Internet. And Steve, is, Anthony, is that what your clients see? You explain it to them like that. No, Do most of them are still the mad at me. No, they're still mad. A lot of my clients, they're still with me because they like me and we've got multiple decades of history together. I'm very good at generating guilt. I learned that from my mom, and so I had to guilt <laughs> people into staying in the fund. But they're still pissed, honestly. Five years from now, when that endowment, where's that endowment now, Dan? It's probably cooking again, right? Well, just the, just the uh, that position is, it's up uh, 12 are they, times are they, on that position. Are they loving you again? Or are they no, they, you they don't want to say anything because they oh, know in if in they say anything, I'm going to rip their heads off. Yeah, they're right, embarrassed. <laughs> They're, Good. They're, so that's they're what's going on now. I'm getting these ambivalent calls, you know, you know, and they're like, they want to kill me, but then they're like, wait a minute. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, in January, Robbie Michnick, I don't know if anybody knows who he is, but he was on the Bitcoin project at Blackstone. And I ran into Larry Fink in uh, the Four Seasons Hotel, Al Mariana Island in Abu Dhabi. And this was Abu Dhabi Finance Week. So this is probably November of 22, maybe October, something like that. And I'm in the lobby with him, and he says, hey, hey, you like, you like Bitcoin? I said, I do. Because oh, I think Bitcoin sucks. Larry Fink. I just made this big investment in Circle. I love stable coins. I said, okay. I said, you have to do more homework on this because... Anybody that does the homework, anybody that does the Tapiero-like fundamental homework, it's a one-way ticket towards the asset. You're not doing the homework and saying, oh, you know, I'm not buying the asset. And so Larry, to his credit, did the homework, sends Robbie Michnick to see me. Robbie says to me, this place is very bureaucratic. If I don't get outside money into this BlackRock Bitcoin trust, they're going to kill the project. I think you know my partner, Brett Messing, right? So he's our chief investment officer. And so he wired Robbie $10 million. Skybridge was the first outside money into the BlackRock Bitcoin Trust prior to its application filing 
for the ETF. Well done. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not patting ourselves on the back. I'm just telling you, it was at the bottom of the market. Nobody wanted it. BlackRock was defensive. It is the largest ETF launch in the history of BlackRock. In and they are, ETFs, I think. No? I'm sorry? In the history of ETFs. Yeah, in, in the history of ETFs. I'm sorry, yeah. So, so just think about, like, you know, again, apply context. You've had good days in your life and you've had bad days in your life. But when you're having the bad day, you got to keep going. You know, we didn't know if we were going to stay in business, not stay in business. I'm in Brioni today, but I thought, man, I'm heading for a barrel and suspenders. I mean, this could be really <laughs> bad for me and my family. But when you're in, what did Churchill say? When you're in hell, when you're going through hell, keep going. And, 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 and believe, if you've done the homework, you've got to believe in yourself. And you got to make that bet. And even just see that conversation with BlackRock is evidence of the network effect that we've been talking about, which undeniably is one of the biggest macro shifts. But speaking of other macro shifts, and what data sets should we be looking at? And Dan, do you think interest rates, U.S. interest rates matter for crypto? Yeah, I, you know, I want to say one thing about this because, you know, having been a portfolio manager for so many years working for those guys and having my own entity as well, you know, I lived through many extremely volatile uh, periods and ups and downs and yelling and negative years and all of this nonsense. So um, I've also had an experience starting uh, a few businesses. And so what I, I think the challenge in the space isn't necessarily to say, okay, Bitcoin is going up, Bitcoin's going to 200, 300. Um, but my focus has been to create a fund that owns these larger companies in the space that essentially is, I don't want to say impervious to the volatility, but we really, the way that I've structured the portfolio, it was in a way specifically not to get hurt in these bear phases. And so, you know, I didn't have, so many, many years of those clients and LPs being upset, we didn't really have any because I think that this, the, um, the structure of our fund may not be, we may not go up as much as yours, maybe in the bull phases um, or other uh, investors, but we have tremendous cushion on the downside. And so I call it a sleep well at night structure because I lived through many, many years of, of not having that. So there are ways to get exposure to the space without you know, having to meet your maker every three years. So I just wanted to make that point. Now you said interest rates or? Point. Yeah, what, do you, what impact do you think US interest rates have on crypto, if any? Mm. You know, I would have thought, um, well, it's remarkable that the short rate is 5% and that we just hit an all time high on the Bitcoin. I think that uh, almost nobody would have suggested that that was possible because many of the traditional macro investors, uh, you know, pundits, thinkers, um, they think Bitcoin is merely a reflection of the rate of change of liquidity coming from the central banks and mostly the Fed. Um, you know, and every time someone says that to me, I say, I mentioned that statistic again. Well, how could that be if, you know, Bitcoin and ETH are up 99% against the S&P, against bonds, against real estate over the last 10 years? How could it be? There's an independent driving fundamental um, that's driving this whole asset class. And um, so I think in the very short term, um, the move from zero to five uh, partially uh, drove the bear phase. But uh, I mean, I think it's remarkable how quickly Bitcoin has blown off, you know, the the Fed cycle. Uh, it's looking ahead, maybe. I mean, as the Nasdaq uh, has a little bit. But I, I'm surprised, um, and I think it really calls into question whether liquidity is that big a factor. Yeah, that's you, what I've been wondering yeah. a lot recently, too. When you look at the historical movements of Bitcoin and you look at something like the halving, and this is prior to the ETF, do you think we're in like a, an ADBC situation, meaning where we have the ETF and now Bitcoin will act differently? over the forward 14 years? Or do you think it'll have this take on the same? I don't think it can go up 
n- another 99 percent again well no i don't mean it like that I mean, but it, I, it, it, it typically has gone up like 4x from a halving yeah so i guess what i'm saying is yeah, it could go it's up. not gonna it's not gonna have the performance that it had from zero to 14 right. but right what i'm saying what do you what do you what do you think the impact of the ETF is on the forward fundamentals of Bitcoin? Well, I mean, it's just, just a structural up, sh- uh, up move. So you said 4X is what it is? Well, yeah, so that would be 200,000, 240 from 60 today? Yeah, two, 200,000 over the 18 months from the halving. Yeah, so. I think that's reasonable. I mean, if you think about it, it's only, what, 3, 4X? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it's not that big a deal for Bitcoin and certainly for assets in this space. Yeah. I mean, historically, it's just the numbers are now getting really big, you know, trillions. Um, you know, where the space, I think, has a total value. And I, I look at the spaces, all the cryptocurrencies plus all the value of all the businesses is around four and a half trillion. So that's something. You know, I think that that's something. Uh, again, can it for, go to ten for, trillion? For, I think for so. a global asset, a truly global asset. But again, speaking of looking forward, we can't not talk about the potential impact of the upcoming U.S. elections. Um, Anthony, how do you think the U.S. elections are going to go, and do they matter for crypto? <laughs> Listen, you know, I'm a pretty opinionated guy, as people know, and I'll just I'll just say this: if you are an American in the room and you've studied the Constitution, it is a brilliant document because it has the founders figured out in their wisdom to separate the powers in the document and to make the country a decentralized government. And if you're sitting in this room, you know that things that are decentralized have certain anti-fragile properties to them and they are a lot of ways better than centralized things. And so The United States right now is suffering from no memory of fascism. If you're on this continent, you have parents, grandparents, great-grandparents that have experienced the scourge of fascism. You You went on a field trip here in England to where the Blitz took place and people died and houses were bombed out and you've seen pictures of people hiding in the tubes. If you're in Germany, uh, you know what happened there. And if you're in Poland, you know what happened there. And so this continent has hereditary memory of fascism. In the United States, we have none of that, unfortunately, because we put down the fascist movement in the late 1940s. Huey Long and Charles Lindbergh, who were the first America First movement, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was a very successful politician. He put them down. But the Americans don't remember this. So certainly in the first few years of fascism, the trains will run on time and things are quite efficient. And it always ends with kleptocracy and it always ends with death and destruction. And so for me, I would take bad policy over the threat of something that would knock out the separation of powers. And I'll tell one other White House story because... If Paul Ryan was here, he would really laugh at this. And, and uh, I remember the day of this, too. This was a Tuesday. And we were, we were in the Oval Office, and Trump was telling Paul Ryan, he was fingering him. These are two tall guys. I'm not a tall guy. He was fingering him. And he was using some expletives, and he said, you work for me, USOB. You work for me. And Ryan looked at him and said, I actually don't work for you. I'm in a totally separate article of the Constitution. And these are separate but equal branches of government. And oh, by the way, I'm here to serve the American people. I'm not working for you. And Paul, okay, quit because he knew the wave of Donald Trump was coming and he didn't want to be Mike Johnson. You know, Mike Johnson is like if Joel Olstein and Jim Jordan had a baby, it'd be Mike Johnson. You know, I mean, this guy's the character of characters, right? But but Paul left because he's a principled guy. And so for me, I will fight Donald Trump toe-to-toe from now until the election. And I will do the very best I can to explain to the people I grew up with who love Donald Trump. These are blue-collar people. My dad was a crane operator. I will explain to those people the best way that I can 
what the danger that he represents. Now, the Bitcoiners love the guy, and him and I have sparred over this a little bit. And so now let him talk about the orange maniac. Go ahead. Talk about that. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so we, the Italians love Trump, by the way. I don't know what it is. We have to figure that out, too. I mean, it's, like, it's like a Mussolini love crisis or some shit. But anyway, go ahead. So Anthony turned, the, turned to the uh, philosopher here, so we switch roles. I, I'm only looking at uh, the data, and this isn't, I don't have a strong personal opinion. Um, I don't know Trump at all. Um, but... I see that he won 99 out of 100 counties, I think, or 98 out of 99 in Iowa, and no one's ever done that before, and then, you know, won New Hampshire as well, and I don't think anyone has done that in a very long time. So just looking at the data, it just seems to me that it, it probably will be a landslide. Um, not that I'm betting on it, um, but, and there are other, I think, facts of Anthony have a lot of fighting to do. I think that's just the reality of it. Um, you know, I'm not so worried about fascism. I think the U.S. system is very flexible. Uh, I think this decade, the entire decade, um, unlike any decade I can remember, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, I think is the decade of innovation. We've never had so many different uh, interesting technologies hit all at once. And this is partially the Kathy Wood thesis, which I do believe. And you know, you have AI now and robotics and blockchain and health tech and all of these things hitting at the same time. So I'm actually very bullish. Uh, I'm very bullish on NASDAQ. Um, and I think you know this run continues for quite a while. And you know, markets, if there were reason to be concerned in a structural way about politics, I think you'd see it there. I'm, I'm a free markets guy before anything else, a Reagan sort of free markets person. So uh, I, I just see blue sky. Um, and having been a macro guy for so long, you're always looking for, you know, macro negative events. But I think, um, I think that's finished for now. And what, and Dan, what do you uh, think the outlook is for the SEC, uh, either in a change of administration or a continuation of the same? Yeah, I mean, as a, again, as a free markets guy, Gensler came out in the summer and he sued Coinbase. And within a month or two later, the Coinbase stock was up 200%. So, you know, which largely means to me that it's just totally irrelevant. And um, I believe that everybody, the markets are a voting mechanism. Um, and I think the, the market spoke. So I don't, I think it's a fading risk, but you had some thoughts on Gensler, no? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll say something contrarian because I've been really thinking about this. I think Gensler actually helped to save the industry and abet the industry. And you're going to say, what do I mean? Just follow this for a second. He was very politically motivated. I hate that. I want our regulators to be apolitical and focus on right or wrong as opposed to left or right. But the delay of the spot ETF allowed for the space of exposure to things like FTX and the implosion of Three Arrows and... Voyager and BlockFi, and I could add to the list of things that happened in 2022. And so I got this wrong, among many other things. I thought Bitcoin was going to 100,000 by the first quarter of 2022, because if you read administrative law, you pass a ETF for the Bitcoin futures. There's a clause in the administrative law in the United States that you can't be arbitrary and capricious and the administration of the law. And so definitionally, he had to approve a spot ETF. But he didn't do it due to political reasons. But the great irony is that delay, I think, really helped the industry because I think if we're at 60,000 today or thereabout. It's a much sturdier 60,000. It's a much less levered 60,000, less FTX 60,000. Less, less hyped. Less hyped. 
And so weirdly, he helped us, but I really do want him not to be the SEC chairman any longer. And so we'll in have just, to see what happens. In just a couple of seconds, because we're running out of time, unfortunately, I could talk to you all day. ETF, sorry, ET, uh, EF, ETF, what are the odds? Uh, so I would say uh, maybe by the end of the year, but very unlikely in May. Dan? Yeah, the, the same. I mean, I, the May, end of the year, it's all the same. But it will coming. eventually happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, it has to happen, but he's going to do things to delay it. You know, his, he's works for Elizabeth Warren. So One of the great things that uh, we all focus on is the impact of change on markets, and we are certainly in times of great change. It's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you all for being here. Today.